in part two of the episode with Dr. Sean Barkley. Wherever you get more doctors, you get more asthma and you also get more antibiotics prescribed. So where you get lots of doctors in a place, remember there's a little bit of competition in our system, you know, mm. um, so they're going to give you kind of what you expect to get. What we've created is kind of a consumerism of medicine and the consumer gets what he wants. But society needs to think about what it's asking from its doctors mm. as much as doctors have to think about what they're delivering. Yeah. And that's back to Socrates. You have to self-examine and you have to be prepared to be wrong. Um, but our system doesn't allow for, for doctors to say they're wrong. Governments will make announcements like, there's a new antiviral available for COVID. Just phone your GP and he'll give you some, you know. And you have yet to see the clinical data on the on the drug that you are now expected to hand out to your patients. Mm. Talk about your little world. Certainly. Uh, can I ask, uh, you know, I, I, I can only imagine, I don't know, but, um, you know, having experienced, you know, sort of health traumas, I would call it, in within the family, you know, what's it like being a doctor, having relationships with people, and I mean, it's, they're dealing usually, they're not turning up because they're on the top of the world. Yeah. Right, it's it's a, it can be a bit doom and gloom and grim, and obviously there, there's bad news along the way as well. Oh. What's what's that like? Does it take its toll? I mean, you've been doing it for thirty-five. Lovely years. question. That's that's a lovely question. I think I think it can. Um, I think it's no different to any of us. So if if you're under a lot of pressure for too long, you know, uh, and you're stressed, mm. then yes. Some of that, um, some of that sort of negativity can rub off, and you can get quite down. Um, what I find interesting about my profession is that, you know, from time to time you'll have interaction with the, the medical council. Now, there was a newspaper report that sort of just hit on the mark, and I was quite pleased to read it because it meant that that many of my other colleagues felt similar to me, was that the medical council keeps telling GPs to take care of themselves. It's like it's our responsibility to take care of ourselves. And if we don't do it, we get into trouble. <laughs> it's like, better take care of yourself, otherwise we're going to come after you <laughs> and we're going to not you let you practice. But they'd never comment about great, the system. Great motivation. Yeah. Never about the system in which you work where it's almost impossible mm. to take care of yourself because mm. the whole system is geared to GP seeing more and more patients for less and less money it's just prevalent in the model we have. It's, um, and unless you want to take a cut in pay and w in a, work in an isolated place, it, it, it doesn't look like it's going to change. But you're responsible for your own mental health. It's almost impossible to, without the time to do that. Um, and, um, but they, they sort of link it almost like an eth you have an ethical obligation. So if you're not taking care of yourself, you're kind of morally... Failing, you know, because you, yeah. you're not ethically, you must be in good shape to take care of people. So it's really bizarre profession I work with that the profession itself is one of the worst at looking after its own. It doesn't want to be seen to be sort of favoring doctors in some way, you know, because because the public wouldn't like that. You know, if we if we really looked after the doctors, are, are we, you know, almost as if you look after the doctors, you're not looking after the patients. It's an either or. And I'm really curious at that. Mm. Um, that, um, that, that, 
that this this is how you left feeling. At, at least this is my perception of, of with it. Now, I know that if you had to sort of go, you know, go onto an official forum and come up, they would name all the resources, all the websites that doctors can go to use <laughs> to look yeah. after themselves. And, yeah. and they would say beautiful words. But if you, in the profession, there was in the newspaper the other day, a colleague said that if you said to the council that you were, medical council, that you were struggling, you know, with, with the very issue you've raised about being in this environment of suffering and mm. negativity for large parts of your day, if you said to them, yeah, I'm struggling, they'd say, you can't, you can't practice. Well, I think you have to certain take some time off. Right? Irony, though, isn't it? So yeah. It's like, that, you know, is that not, I mean, we're, we're living in a world at the minute where, thankfully, <clears throat> um, knowledge and awareness and discussions about mental health and well-being are you know, more prevalent than they've ever been before. Mm. Right? Now, we, we could discuss uh, the, the merits of that, but maybe we, that's another conversation. But it's, is it almost like the medical profession are, are like plumbers that don't want to admit they've got a leak at home or something? I mean, is, is there an element of that to it, that actually they're trying to protect the, the system by saying, no, we don't suffer from the stuff that other humans suffer from? <laughs> that's lovely. Really, I, I think you, you're right. I think there's an element of that. I mean, we're... Um, I think that's exactly it, really. We, you're trying to protect the status quo because you know that it's almost like they're afraid that if you you know you pull out one Lego block, uh, you know the whole system will fall down. And I, I'm still, you know, I'm still, you know, apparently this end of the world, New Zealand, with its I think was it Erebus disaster where the plane flew into the yeah. mountain and. Where up until that time, you know, they had apportioned blame to disaster, disasters to individuals. And then along came this gentleman, I forget who he was, a, a, a you know, famous gentleman who was given the task of looking at the series of events that led to it. Mm. Now, now, apparently there's still some controversy about that because he basically talked about a system failure, that there were little things that happened along the way mm. Uh, that that contributed to the disaster, and um, and there was still pressure amongst some parts of the community. I don't know if it was from survivors' families to blame the pilot, you know, and and they're up and there's a battle there, and you can only imagine that the reason for that is probably, you know, com possibly you know money related. You know, who can we, you know, we want to sue somebody for the loss of our loved one, which you can completely understand. Now, I may not be privy to, to the actual facts, but I think the point I'm trying to make is that it was the first time in where s systems were seen as important contributors to disaster. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, and it's now become... So despite now 30, 40 years of this kind of thinking in the modern world where we talk about health and safety being a system thing, in, in the medical profession, the, the complaint never goes to the system. It goes to an individual doctor. Who touched it next? Uh, it, it never goes, like, we think the system, and, and general practices are the most vulnerable because they don't have a PR person or a complaints department like a hospital. Mm -hmm. you got you. Mm -hmm. And your employer usually runs like heck because if there's a negative outcome, they worry that their brand, mm -hmm. you know, the brand of the surgery yeah. will be affected by that doctor's uh, uh, fault. Mm -hmm. So, so the, you're, you're essentially the pilots. Sorry, you're the pilots, really. Aren't yes, you? that's right. You're the pilots, and but the system in your work contributes to you making an error. It just has to, and um, and if you're under pressure and time, you can't record things properly. You you know you don't have time. Do you see how it all? And this idea that if we admit that, then we have to gonna gonna have to go back to the drawing board, or maybe not the drawing board, but we have to maybe go back in time, to to some. Just to digress with another story that you'll enjoy. I mean, we've just got we've got to remember Edward Jenner. Okay, do you know who Edward Jenner is? No. Well, he's the GP that gave gave vaccinations their their center stage. You know, kind of you know a, 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 the credit for vaccine sort of vaccination has to go to a farmer who had heard via the grapevine that. And it was not uncommon community knowledge, this, 
you know, um, that if you gave your child a dose of cowpox, that would protect them against smallpox, which was rushing through the UK at the time. It had devastated, I don't need to remind you of the smallpox mm. pandemics that went around the world and devastated populations all over the world. But let's just talk about the one that was sweeping uh, Europe and, and the UK. And, and so his patients shared this with him. Now, now we, th this is so sort of, it links in so nicely with what we've been talking about because he listened. <laughs> you know, old friend, he listened. He went, oh. And he kind of facilitated. He didn't just go, did you get that off the ancient internet, you know, which was, you know, the local. Because <laughs> the ancient internet was the local pub, you know. <laughs> and um, he listened. And he then uh, took that, and he, together with the family, got he inoculated his other children. The farm had already done it to, I don't know if it was to his wife or to one of his children, uh, before going to his GP discussing it. And then the GP said, I think we should take this further. And then, with his permission, he inoculated the rest of the family, and they didn't get the smallpox. And, that, and then it just took off. Mm. Um, but here's the thing about that general practitioner. So a couple of things. One is that that he never took a dime for anything he discovered, even though he was offered a dime. And he went bankrupt three times, and the government had to bail him out three times. He took an awful lot of flack for his promotion of vaccination and was ridiculed in magazines like Punch and all that. You know, mm. uh, There were cartoons of him giving back cowpox to people and them turning into cows. And yeah. he was absolutely... And he, he died... The criticism got to him he went. He never took up a position in Harley. Is it Harley Street? Yeah. Um, although he was offered one because he was doing good work, um, he went back to his practice in the, you know somewhere in the lakes or somewhere. I, I don't know where. But and and is more famous now uh, for his work on the cockatoo, <laughs> a bird, than he is for the work he did in vaccination. Um, but but in order to to do that, he had to be one of those old-fashioned. First of all, he listened to the patient. He worked mm. in his community. He, but he also took the time, or had the time, to to advance his ideas. Mm. All of those things are are lacking. Having said that, it just it just reminds me. So, um, at one point, I was I was on a committee for the college, the Waikato branch of the college, and. Um, there's a long story behind that, but I think we, you know, we've talked enough now. I won't tell you that, but that's a story for another day on how, as an, I wasn't a member of the college at the time, but ended up on their committee. And I, that's a funny story in itself. <laughs> and, and so many years ago, I was on this committee, and I noticed at the time that this was a, a branch of the committee. So you have, you know, districts, and you have the College of GPs, and then you have the Waikato branch of mm. the College of GPs. And they all do local, you know, they look more locally. Nothing magic about that. But this was a sort of the Waikato and the Bay of Plenty branch, and I would go there. And I noticed in their kitty they they had $110,000 to do something with. This was from subscription. But it never really, the meetings were really curious, uh, the meetings that we had. Uh, none of the meetings advanced an idea on how to spend this money. Now, while I'm telling the story, is quite funny. I went away from the committee uh, for a while, and that's another funny story why I left the committee. Um, and then I came back to it uh, under encouragement to go back to the committee. And there was still $110,000 in the committee. You know, over a space of seven or, or so years, they'd not spent a cent. And this did my head in because, you know, you know come on. And along the lines of what we've been talking about, I thought, no, money is time. So I put forward a proposal that what we do with the money is that we give a, a select few of GPs in our district time to do research. Mm. And time is money. Yeah. So if we could pay uh, them a day a month or a year or whatever it took, I, I forget the details, then that was buying their time so they could actually do a little bit of Edward Jenner stuff, where there was something in their little world yeah. that they need, they felt needed to be taken to the next step mm. to do um, GP research. Yeah. Then we might revive some of that, 
that thirst for knowledge and well mm. by giving them the time and time is money. So paying them a fee and then saying, look, why don't you study something that you found is not happening in, in primary care and mm. general practice that you feel needs a bit of research? Um, I mean, the kind of research I'm talking about is the fact that at med school, you're taught how to diagnose sinusitis, you see. Pain, yes, you know, runny nose. Yeah. And then somebody did some GP research in New Zealand a few years ago, brilliant stuff, and discovered that when they, they got these people and said, right, and the person said, it's my sinuses, doc, you know? Okay. And then what they did was they, they, they asked the GP, okay, what's your diagnosis? And he said, sinusitis was the diagnosis, and he has the treatment. And then what they did is they took that patient and then they sent them for a CT scan to see if they actually had any signs of inflammation of the sinuses on a CT scan. And the docs got it wrong 67, two-thirds of the time. They got it wrong. They didn't have a sinusitis. So that really put a dampener on what you're taught are the signs and symptoms of sinusitis in med school. Good research, though. Because it advances. You go, okay, well, what I think is sinusitis and what, you know, uh, what is sinusitis are two different things. And I must admit that bit of knowledge has helped me immensely mm. with how I deal with people that come with those symptoms. Mm. And I share that knowledge with them. Now, that was done in general practice by a, a general practitioner. Mm. And that's the kind of research that needs to be done. But we're back to that whole thing we've been talking about all, all this time, is that having the time to pursue the knowledge and absorb it. And I think there's an underlying theme of the whole conversation, really, mm. which is time and time is money. And so therefore, there's not a lot of time to do anything. So that's whether that's refining your craft, yeah. spending time with your patients, or looking after yourself, because clearly no one else is going to do that as a that's right. GP. Is is that the case? You you know who's yeah. looking after the, our GPs? Um, I think I think we uh, well the GPs are trying to do that job. It just depends what who you surround yourself. with. So is that other GPs looking after GPs? Well, well, you know, at the moment you go through phases in your practice, and at the moment, you know, we've uh, the the practice I'm at. There's sort of nine nine general practitioners. The place should have fourteen, but we're short of, of general practitioners. And um, uh, and so at the moment, uh, the culture within the practice is better than it used to be, in that that there are we've realised that we really ought to be looking after our clients. And so, and as one of the senior GPs, I mean by years, um, uh, you know, I've taken in my own head, not sort of from the higher ups, taken, made it my task to to ensure that I'm looking in on some of my younger colleagues and making sure that they're having a laugh, and that that they they've been heard and that the the stress of the job is acknowledged, and and sometimes that's all you can do because I am an employee. I'm not. I don't own the practice, so mm. I'm, I'm much of what how my time is is, is prescribed, um, and it certainly the practice itself doesn't offer a GPs any time. Mm. You know, they they tell you, "Are oh, you okay?" But they don't offer you. The okay should come with we've knocked off half a day for you because you're looking stressed. Yeah. Which in my own practice used to happen when I had my own practice. Mm. My staff used to do a great job of looking after me, mm. and if I got behind with my paperwork got behind with myself, they would literally, you know, hang up the phone and say, Dr. Barkley's doing a delivery. <laughs> He's doing. Yeah. And then come into my office with a cup of coffee and say, look, you need to sign off on a few things. You need mm -hmm. to take a breath. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that was just amazing. And that that's what you want to surround yourself with those kind of people. And I don't think, Is that I don't point? think that's big, I mean, a, a big ask. I mean, no. Lots of companies do that. I mean, every you know, it's well, not. It's a. It's a. It should be part of your modern practice. I mean, well, every every workplace is encouraged to look after the health, safety, and well-being of its people. Why is? I mean, you, you would think that in the health sector, it would go without saying. Yeah, yeah, you would. You just would. You'd think that they would because you'd recognise the value of it. Yeah. So, so, and everybody does. So, I, I look. I've got some great friends, and one of my golfing friends is manager of a wholesale pet product um, company. Now, mm. I don't know the name of it, but it's flipping good business. Should have got into it. <laughs> and um, and so he, uh, you know, they had this amazing pet food that, you know, for my cat, because my cat used to love my cat. But, um, 
And uh, so he said, look, pop around after golf. I'll sell you a bag or two of the stuff. It's mm. amazing. Yeah. So I followed him to his office space. And it was a warehouse in the industrial area. And we walk in. It was like Google. It was like a bean bag. There was a big screen TV. There was a pool table. There was mm. a kitchen. There was a Barbie thing outside the back. And I went, wow. And this is, and I said, what's this? Way? He said, this is for the staff. Mm. I mean, if you're having a bad day, literally you, yeah. you you can come out and just chill for a moment mm. and sort of encourage it because uh, it's all been shown their productivity improves and and it's about you know recently in the newspaper there was that company that's paying everybody five days they're doing four and productivity's yeah. gone up it's not like this is you know that i'm the fountain of something new mm. this is, but in in medicine you can come to our tea room if you like it doesn't it's interesting eh? it's room. interesting the way you would think yeah, you would. The industry it's an or sector that would have got a grasp of that the most and should actually be kind of promoting that with other businesses and people, you know, patients. And they just don't, don't they just don't, it's don't just get it or don't want to get it. I yeah, don't they don't want to get it because it, it's time, you know, there are not enough doctors ready and you take them out for an hour every day. That's four or five patients that they could be seeing and problem solved. But there's lots of fun stuff in history. Like there's a guy who, who's on the YouTube, he's called Dead Doctors Tell No Lies. And what he did one day with is that he used to travel a lot throughout America. I think he was a Nobel Prize nominee. I, I, I might be correct. I, incorrect, but I, that's how I remember the story. And and he, he went around the country and he would pick up the local newspaper where he was and look at the obituaries, which I thought was funny. And he started to notice the number of doctors that were dying like in their 50s. And he thought, what? This was some time ago, by the way. I, it may have changed. Uh, but I thought it was great. I mean, it immediately got my curiosity. Because he discovered that doctors really, a lot of the time, they die too young, which is kind of like not a good advert. No. <laughs> okay. It's like um, the head of cardiology at at since Sinai or something like that was, uh, and she died at fifty four of a heart attack. You know? <laughs> and she was head of cardiology. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, there were like stories like that in in his story. He was telling these stories, yeah. and and so he was curious about what the heck, you know, with my profession. You know, my, uh, now he was first a vet, and then he became a general practitioner or something like that. Anyway. Um, so he had also had a very interesting background. Uh, and he, he kind of got curious about that and went looking into it. And, mm -hmm. and, and for him, it was all about minerals and vitamins. The fact that, that, that he felt that we ought to be taking, that all the, all the people that lived the longest on the planet appeared to be close to um, sort of mountain streams that have a lot of minerals in them. You know, if you look around Japan and Peru, and they're very high up, and yeah. you know, and and one of the contributing factors, I wouldn't like to say that I know all the facts about this, but they live a longer than people down at sea level in crowded places. Mm -hmm. So, so he he kind of promotes the idea that we all need to be taking more minerals and vitamins. Um, but he got there by looking at the fact that wh while I, exp you know, I say to people, <laughs> you've got to take sorry. <laughs> You've got to take good uh, food and, you know, eat your vegetables. And then, you know, all my colleagues are dying in their 50s. And is it because they're not looking after themselves? Yeah. Which is not good. No. I mean, it's not good. Not we, good. We, we kind of should be at the forefront. We should be like those Viking warriors of health. And we're not. It, and it, why yeah. is that? That's, I mean, it kind of, kind of sort of lends itself to the fact that we are – and I know I'm speaking really out of turn here with my doctor sitting across the table, but is it a symptom of the fact that our health system is a little bit ambulance at the bottom of the cliff yeah. as opposed to um, being healthy? As in, you know, like we're fixing rather than preventing. But without and, a doubt. And our doctors are also not preventing. I'm not in the business of preventing. They're in the preventing of business of fixing and so it's a kind of fixing mindset and so not looking for it or not doing anything about it i'm not sure no you're on to it i i think i mean the the stark reminder of things like this are you know the government um so it goes back to a bit of philosophy here we go 
<laughs> so <laughs> in terms of how we measure things, you see. So how do you measure well-being? You know, and I know that a lot of people have got questionnaires that ask you, but it's not an easy task. Okay? It's mm. a qualitative kind of question. And, mm. um, uh, and governments don't do well-being very well. They just don't do it. They like to think they do it well, but they don't do it very well because it actually is quite difficult to achieve. Mm. Um, it, it's very variable, and what does it mean? Um, but it's much easier for governments to go to the polls and say, we've done, you know, couple of thousand hip replacements. I mean, that's a real number. And we like them. We're very comfortable as a human race with numbers. We can measure that. We're comfortable with things we can measure. You know, we can measure the number of something. But um, it's like when you meet people, what do you do? Oh, I'm a builder. Oh, okay, very good. I know what builders do. They build. How many houses do you build? I bought 10. I know what you do. It's great. You're doing a good job. And then you meet somebody, you know, what do you do? I'm a poet. And I talk about philosophy all day. Everybody goes, okay, I don't know how to measure that. Is that a real job? Is it important? Is, but we know that that's a valuable thing to do, and we wish more people would do it. Uh, but we can't measure it, so we don't want to talk about it. Um, and so, so here's the thing. you know, We will very readily, and the taxpayer agrees with this approach, that we will pay for hip replacements. But we will not pay for a personal trainer to perhaps prevent people from going on the hip replacement waiting list. There's good evidence to suggest with the right strengthening and stretching program mm. to, to chosen individuals, not everybody, but you, you might get them off the waiting list for a hip replacement. But we're very happy to keep them on a waiting list, unproductive in their lives and their jobs, because hip pain is just a shocker. Mm. It's a real destroyer of quality of life. Uh, but during that period of you know, we won't spend any money on giving them, say, a free membership to a gym with a one-on-one -on -one trainer. And the, the cost difference is huge. Well, why, why is that? Why have we not gone to that? Okay, well, that's... I mean, it's not, you know, because from a numbers that's game That's an point interesting, of view, yeah. That's, it makes uh, sense, doesn't it? We all know it makes sense when you it does. It's, lay it's out not, the business case yeah. for it. It's like, well, actually, is it a psychology thing? Is it... Is it something that we, we don't know for certain that you would need that hip replacement, so therefore this could be a wasted investment? I, do you know what I mean? It's you like know, it's prevention. Great. I, it's think you're, you're, I think that's what you're pointing out here is it's not really for doctors to decide that. Because we do, we do function within us. You know, we, we are advocates for things, but we're not necessarily the deciders of all the truth. We, we you know, we, uh, we want to involve patients and the public in the decisions about what we spend the health dollar on because it is that we work in a resource confined space and and so we have to be mindful of 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 how we spend our resources mm. now when i start talking like that you can see that it has to involve the community mm. in that discussion the question is what kind of knowledge are they being fed yeah. i mean are, are they being told about those those um Studies that suggest that a one-on-one -on -one trainer, you know, might potentially help them avoid, because because some people do do it. I, I do share the knowledge with my patients, and some of them, of means, mm. will go and do exactly that. They will go and get a personal trainer, and they will get better, and they will come back and they're grateful for the knowledge. But it would have cost them a fair bit, mm. um, and and sometimes you can't avoid hip replacement. So I'm not saying replace it, but you can see my point about. It's a worldview. It's it's back to this idea of, of, you know, what what you can measure and how that's used politically and uh, you know as as a fact and and using the facts mm -hmm. in a way that I don't know perpetuates the status quo or mm. you know and 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 there's some criticism in the medical profession because you get paid very very well to do hip replacements, you don't get paid that well to be a one-on-one -on -one trainer. So is that uh, yeah, it could uh, be. That's uh, got to be a driver as well? Uh, well, yeah, unconscious bias comes into it, you know, yeah. despite the refusal of all of us to say that, you know, we, you know, we do have unconscious biases in the way we behave, yeah, exactly. and also the way you fund things, you you create an unconscious bias mm -hmm. in behaviours. The way you yep. you fund things, you don't fund quantity. Yeah. You, you I mean, you fund quant quantity, not quality, in in health very often. Mm. 
I, I think there's something else as well. We you mentioned about the community, what the community wants, right? I don't know that the community knows what they want, but I think a, a part of it as well comes to the, the psychology of the community, the individuals within the society, and what they vote for and what they would like. And I think when you when when I think about the psychology of change and people wanting to make changes, and I'm a strong believer that we only do there's only two reasons why we do anything. One is to avoid a loss and one is to gain something. Mm. The avoiding the loss is, is a, has got a, a lot more emotion attached to it because if you've got something, you're going to lose it. You know what it would feel like to not have it. To gain something, it's harder because it's not as tangible. You don't know what it feels like. So therefore, there's less emotion attached to it. So, so in this context, um, yes, you might lose the use of your hip, but actually you've got your hip and you don't know what it feels like to, to lose that until you've lost it. Gotcha. To gain the longevity of a good working hip without having to have it replaced is future focused and I don't know what that feels like and I don't know, you know, until it's too late, I won't be invested enough to make that change. So maybe it's society not driving the change in the health system. You know, we've got to reach a tipping point at some point where we tip over to be more prevention and health focus than when I say health focus I mean what you know what I mean by that as in uh, being healthy rather than fixing up ailments well there's a whole lot of things you've mentioned there that, that just make my brain light up you see so for instance when I first arrived in New Zealand I got the opportunity to coach rugby and I coached the army side in a place called Wairua was a place and mm-hmm. and so what struck me on within a very short time of being is that I would see a, um, um, a soldier in the morning with a very badly damaged knee. Let's just call it that. <laughs> and that afternoon he'd be on the paddock and I'd be coaching my rugby and I'd have a frown on my face saying, didn't we just talk mm. about your knee and you're here training rugby on a knee that probably needs surgery? Mm. What are you doing? And the reply I got, the first reply I ever got in this country all those years ago was, don't worry, ACC will take care of you. See, so, so despite the, I know that the the goal of ACC was was noble. It was by a bunch of guys sat around and discussed a system that didn't, no blame system. You know that we could. It, it was an extension of the of the social kind of mm. welfare state. It was mm. look after people who've injured in a way that doesn't look for blame, and uh, that was noble, and I, I applaud it. But but you can see it created this kind of perverse behaviour. Um, and I saw it on a few occasions. For instance, I would see a young mum of 25 with three children and and hubby's a, a soldier and he's off to Bosnia. That's when I arrived, New Zealand was helping out in Bosnia. And, and, she, and she'd be alone at home with three children. And the army had a high standard of how your house and garden could be presented. They would do inspections. Mm. Uh, and so there was quite a bit of pressure to have a well-presented garden and and a tidy home, otherwise, you know, somebody would be in the job. And and for instance, in that circumstance with no help, it wasn't surprising that I spent a lot of my time, you know, with young depressed mums on their own with three children struggling. Mm. And I was puzzled that they didn't just ask for help. They they, they just got some help. They, you know, maybe got somebody, maybe even paid somebody to come in once a week. But oddly enough, within the societal norms at the time, it was not okay to admit that they needed help and not okay to pay somebody, you know, to, to, to do housework. Mm. It's like having a, a servant back in Adelaide. That was just a no, even if you paid them. Mm. But what wasn't socially unacceptable was to feign an injury. So you bent over picking mushrooms in the pit, you know, in the, pit, in the field, and you got a back injury, and then you could get home help. On ACC, yeah. when every fiber of my body would go, oh, you know, mm. so they you see how it feeds into the kind of yeah. uh, so- social yeah. norms where it was created for one reason and ends up being something else. Now that that was a long time ago. New Zealand has evolved since then and changed, but but I do see a lot of un- perverse kind of outcomes from good intention policies. This is why you really do need open discussions about these things. Mm. But trying to get people to have the discussion is really hard. I mean, it's like 
you know, this is we were talking. I was talking with my wife about different forms of democracy, and and democracy is evolving apparently. And I missed that lecture. <laughs> <laughs> They're just disappearing in America, and it's it's evolving here. And I, I'm no expert on. You know, I'm, I understand democracy in a broad sense that it's kind of a participation of the masses, really. Mm. But, but oh my goodness, it's getting a few tweaks, isn't it? And um, mm. what we'll end up with, I'm not sure. But, but you know, I, I'm struck then by um, S- Switzerland. You know, like they have these uh, citizens' referendums, like lots of them. Mm. And somebody wrote an article about living in um, Switzerland where you're constantly being asked your opinion on a particular matter. But it works. It appears to work uh, that after a while you get used to the idea that that actually, because they do everything by referendum, in Switzerland, or a lot of things by referendum that we don't do here, that mm. when the people speak on a referendum and it becomes a fact, and that's real citizens participating in governance, mm. you know, as opposed to leaving it to elected few or unelected few, as mm. the case may be. Um, and I was fascinated by that. And then you come back to the issue of health knowledge and sharing and decision-making. You almost, in my opinion, at times, because of the very questions you've raised and what you said a few minutes earlier about the pros and cons of various approaches to health, you need more of that. You need more of a discussion with everybody. And it has to be a, an uncomfortable discussion. Mm. And where do we spend the money? And and at the same time, use those discussion opportunity to educate people mm. about things that perhaps would help them with their decision mm. and understanding that we are in a resource constraint and so we have to make some difficult choices. Um, and for too long, that discussion was was mostly amongst doctors. Mm. You know, when do I turn the machine off? And, you know, mm. and then that brings me lovely round to my favorite subject, which is philosophy. Because there's no right and wrong. It's a philosophical rule. And you can't run... I mean, you have some examples of other systems, but you can't sort of... You've got to be careful of trying one as an experiment because of the potential for bad outcomes. You have to face that. So it's really kind of nutting it out with lots of, of knowledgeable, mm. knowledge-filled discussions involving everybody. Mm. I mean, that's not to say that you... That the medical fish called lead because it's a bit like, you know, some people come in and sit in the chair and they go, I have health, therefore I'm a health expert. <laughs> so you go, yeah, <laughs> not so sure. It's like, you know, parents who go to school and go, you know, I have three children in school, therefore I know about education. You know? <laughs> and they want to, you have to be, you need some, some experts to be involved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think this discussion is going on in other forums. I think people are are appreciating that in, in many forums. Mm. Because, but, but often the people with the time, I want to learn my favorite subject, the time to participate in these discussions get hijacked. You know, the, the discussion gets hijacked by special interests because for some reason they have more time than the general population to participate in these discussions. Mm. It's... Odd. Yeah, it is. I'd like to take a moment to talk about one of our sponsors. I'm really pleased to announce that we have Sharp New Zealand as a sponsor. And it's great to have Sharp on board because as a customer, I can speak about their products and services from personal experience. And it feels good to be able to endorse and recommend a company because of the level of satisfaction we have regarding the services they provide. And across my businesses, We've certainly been impressed with the care and collaboration we've experienced in our dealings with Sharp. It's certainly a brand that we trust. Sharp has a long history of creating breakthrough products designed to meet the needs of people living in New Zealand. Sharp's leadership in technology innovation ensures it's at the forefront of the pack, providing business solutions from printing and photocopying to interactive meeting solutions and ICT phone systems. No matter where you are or what size your organization, whether you're large or small, Sharp New Zealand can provide their services to you nationwide. If you're looking to upgrade your technology or renew your photocopier leases, talk to your local Sharp team or visit the website at sharp.net.nz. It is. With with that, I'm going to ask a question about 
your future, mm. your legacy. Like life's work is about life, work, and legacy. What's what's uh, what lies ahead for you? And, and I'm going to ask double edged sort of question, if you like. Um, so on a personal level, what what lies ahead for you? And also, what would you like to see change in the health sector? We've, we've touched, I think, on some of that. But what would you like to see change in the health sector um, in, in, say, the next 10 years? Sure, there's... Uh, okay, so... So... Okay, so... Okay, I need the 1.6 billion. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, wow, then you'd see my legacy. <laughs> I just could do with a few more dollars, 1.6. Yeah. Um, but, um, okay, so there's, on a personal level, it's it's really uh, realizing as you hit past the probably the midway mark of, of my time on the planet that, that I, you know, a couple of realizations. So I probably worked harder than I ought to have, believing that work, you know, one of those lovely things, you know, in work, or you'll find salvation. You know, or, you know, maybe it comes from Stalinist Russia or something. You know, work until you drop. But um, and and there's some regret with that, not having the right life work balance. Um, but also understanding the motivation as a as a new immigrant trying to get the family established mm. and falling for many traps that that I I was well aware of but didn't see. Mm. You know, because it wasn't going to happen to me. Yeah. Getting the balance right, because yeah. Um, yeah. I know about it, so. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and um, and and trying to sort of uh, even that out a little bit, and getting a better work life balance, um, and, but not realizing how um, expensive retirement is. You know, to, to have the kind of life that mm. I've worked for, not, not what I you know what I've worked for, not deserve like. But what I've worked for, and it's it's very expensive to retire. You know. But but also um, what I'm leading to is, I've never got to use some of my knowledge, if you like, in a way that I intended as a young man. Um, and I'm talking more about my my zoology, botany, and oceanography. Mm -hmm. I, I never I never got a chance to use that in a meaningful way, mm -hmm. and. And talking of knowledge, uh, I've got to tell a story. So, so when I was doing, I, I, I once had to do like within my zoology degree, I did a, um, you know, you do projects, you know, and one of them was, um, looking, uh, deriving a mathematical model, that. That described the impact. Of the black oyster catcher on the limpet population. Of the intertidal zone, okay, um, and and so you know the black oyster catcher walks along the intertidal zone on the beach and on the rocks and sees a limpet and has to try and hit it at precisely the right angle to flip it over so he can eat the fish, mm. okay, yeah. and if he's not precise, it clamps down and there's no way in hell you'd need a sledgehammer to get that thing off the rock, yeah. so. So for three weeks, I had to sit with a set of binoculars before the age of the iPad, okay, and uh, and a very windy shack, zoology shack on some island, God forsaken island uh, on the uh, west coast of of um, South Africa, and um, and watch this bird, and then mark every time it had a go at the limpet, and then every time it failed, and how many you know took. And then and then look at the reproductive cycle of the limpet and and then oh my goodness I tell you the variables in this thing and how many how long was the you know the tide out for you had to calculate that yeah. and the seasons and breeding uh, how fast did the bird but oh my goodness, I lost track anyway my my the most wonderful uh, supervisor was Professor George Branch who's not he is famous written quite a few books on on uh, marine biology. I went to him and said, look, I'm struggling with this. And he said, look, Sean, try and think about who you're going to give this knowledge to. He said, think about, because that's how you'll get it right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Let's face it, if you're an undergraduate doing this project, your, your audience for this knowledge would be, say, final year at school. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if you, and then as you go up, you get your honors, your masters, PhD. So the audience that you're talking to. Yeah. So he said, so keep it simple to that audience. Mm. Because that's probably what we're thinking. You should produce something that would talk to them. And so reduce the number of variables and then explain where they've disappeared to and how they might impact on your study. And we'll think that's an excellent study. He said, and I think it's great. So I reduced the number of variables to ones that were simple and easy to confront. And then um, and then ready for the presentation. Found my data. And I can tell you now because I know your audience will be sort of really wanting to know. And, <laughs> and I can say with some confidence that the black oyster catcher has no impact on the lipid population. <laughs> 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 the, the, bird, the bird is quite territorial and he only gets a limpet to turn over one in, one in 45. <laughs> and, and the limpet produces, uh, you know, about 2 million sperm, the male, you know, and, you know, it's, the odds are that probably the bird wouldn't really impact on its survival. <laughs> but I had to get there with this mathematical model. And when I did the presentation, you see, and this is why I think I did well in this, okay, because it was really simple, didn't have too many variables, wasn't overly smart. Somebody was doing a, another mathematical model and they had all the variables in it, and nobody understood a word of what he said. You mm -hmm. see, and that was the point. Here's mine. And there are two things I can say about why I did well in that, or got a first for that, was um, one is instead of saying pinna, I said penis. In my presentation, but didn't realize I was saying penis, so I repeated it many, many times. And the professors who were listening and my classmates who were listening to the presentation were in hysterics. <laughs> and so that's the important thing with knowledge is to impart it with a humor. Yeah. And um, <laughs> and so I think that's key to, you know, so so understanding who you're presenting the information to is very important. Unless you get into that group of people, so in order to understand my patients, you know, I need to think like a patient and be ordinary. I can't, I've got to be there. I've got to know what it's like to come home from a hard day's work and, you know, and the kids, you know, I've got to be there and know that stuff. Um, and not sit at it from a sort of a level higher up, and that's one. And two, got to give knowledge with a sense of humor. I mean, you can't take yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, there have been a few articles. I mean, if you just read a lot, you know, humor, I tell you, a laugh is, I mean, somebody said in the newspaper, did I read it today or a couple of days ago, about recovering from cancer or something, and how, and how just humor has just mm -hmm. got to be, I mean, and I'm quite cheeky as well. I mean, I get away with f saying things to patients with humor that it's just a bit naughty, and I think they enjoy it. Otherwise, they would have left the practice. You know? Well, I, I, <laughs> I'm going to recall a story uh, which I think demonstrates your your humor quite beautifully, actually. Okay. And it, and it is something I, I really <laughs> enjoy. Uh, I'm about, worried about, about our discussions. I don't know, because our I'm... meetings. It was many years ago. And um, in fact, my wife was with me, Joanne, and um, we were in your, your we we're in your surgery, and I think it was at a time when we we're actually trying for uh, our second child for Grace, and right. we were having a consult with you. And I remember <laughs> at the time you said to me, uh, <laughs> "Well, why are you here? Do you want to do a prostate check?" It's probably about time you should do that. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, I'm good. No, I'm good. No, no, seriously, you know, it's probably a good idea to do it. I said, yeah, no. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I think, no. I think um, I'd probably want to have a shower first, Sean, and, you know, yeah. sort of, you know. And you were like, no, you don't need to worry about that. Look, <laughs> the only time you need to worry is if both my hands appear on your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> and I nearly fell off the chair laughing. I just wasn't, I mean, it's funny. It's <laughs> funny, but I just wasn't expecting <laughs> that from... You, GP. Or my GP, yeah, and I think that was that was just brilliant. Oh yeah, no, I, brilliant. I mean, I can I can break up. A, I mean, I play touch <laughs> rugby on uh, occasionally. Um, and, and I used to be regularly. Now it's occasionally they've kicked us off the main field. Now I don't like going and disappearing down the hill. <laughs> and um, 
and I mean, I can, I can make, you know, because I think it's a subject that's dear to my heart, dare I say. But um, I did do some time as a urology registrar in London. So prostates was what I did all day, every day. And I must admit, I had great consultants, and I have nothing but good things to say about the time I had in London mm. doing that job. Um, and I think it's just one of those things that, oh, look, it, it's much improved. Men are happy to talk about it now. It's something that's mm. it's mainstreaming into our knowledge and knowing why it's important. And and it is still important because I don't know if the audience knows this, but you know, fifteen percent of all prostate cancers are missed by the blood test. And also we've got now got MRIs, so so we we don't have to stick a needle into everything we don't know about. We we can we can do an MRI. So so the more you know, you need to, and then you your resource constraints, so you can't do an MRI on everybody. So using your biological code is very important. And so I think it's very important. But if I walk into a group of touch players and I want to make them sc scatter, I simply walk into the group with my index. They all know I'm a doctor. <laughs> I walk into the group pointing my index finger. Yeah. Um, and for some reason, this makes men eyes water. Yeah. And run away, and yeah. and you just got to have a lot. You've got to mainstream it. You've got to understand. It's something it. to do with your sausage fingers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, for my special patients, I can always use two, but <laughs> not on the first go. It's it's. Uh, I we, you know I use terms you know like <laughs> just to get them past it. I mean, it's just being being human, really. I think it. I mean, you've yeah. got to obviously pick your moment and. Some moments are inappropriate to have any jokes, and some moments there's a moment there, and you you seize it, mm. you know, and you, you know, you ask patients. Some of them I ask them if they're prostate virgin, and <laughs> and they're blushing, <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and that just breaks the ice a little bit, and I make it, and I tell them also they, I think it's an advantage of having some grey hair, uh, they, I think they appreciate, I don't know, there's something about having a slightly, you know, middle-aged GP who knows his stuff telling you that things are going to be okay or, yeah. you know, there's a little bit of that. Uh, that, you know, I think men, uh, from what I know about men, uh, at least what I've been taught about men, is that, is, is that they learn best from, in, in many cases, from, from people that they secretly admire but won't say. So, so they they see other men and they think, oh, you know, he's you know he's he's got it together for whatever reason it may be, and that is um, unknown to them. So it can't be a complete stranger. They they're not likely to divulge their inner workings to a complete stranger who they admire. Mm -hmm. So he's got to be known to them and and maybe a little bit older. So they they um, just these are rough guides on. Just understanding men a little bit. It's it's like a one oh one, not not in every case. Mm -hmm. And and I'm pleased to say that the generations is changing. I see a change in the attitude of young men. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they much more comfortable around the subject, mm -hmm. much freer to just go, Yep, if this has got to be done, let's do it, Doc. I don't mm -hmm. you know, they don't need to get all shy about it. But they're still, you know, given that prost the prostate cancer does occur more often in the older group, it's necessary to be mindful of that group's social norms and how they're likely to receive the knowledge or receive the option to have their prostate mm -hmm. check. So we're back to that, you know, the subject of today, which is just having the, the more information you have in your head, the more knowledge you have about not just about the, the science but about all the aspects of life to be able to offer the best kind of care. I think I think it goes with it. But there, there is a, you know, wh whether people like it or not, doctors are quite a talented bunch. Even, my pro you know, there's some amazing human beings within medicine. Be not because of any, they think that, but because of the way we choose our doctors to go to university. Mm -hmm. And I know it's trying to change that, and I'm all for that. But traditionally, even getting into med school demands a certain type of person, mm. you know, that mm. that we select. And there have been lots of studies on that, and they, I think they're trying to 
changed that a little bit and I'm all for the change. But there's still that kind of, to get there, you've got to be a certain type of human. And it's more likely that that type of human is quite talented, not just in knowledge. Mm. But there's there's people who play three instruments and talk four languages and mm. and have talents elsewhere that are doctors. And so, so it's okay to say that, that there are talented bunch of humans and... And we and they're there to serve the public in health and and that's to be taken advantage of. Mm. You know, we must mm. take advantage of these clever people. And mm. um, and so, you know, it's not all about me. And you know, I, I've got some, you know, and it's interesting. We had a meeting the other day, and and I've always thought of myself as young until recently. <laughs> no, so you know that I'm still in the journey, like in yeah. the game, and and I am, but. But the table, you know, I was sort of the eldest at the table and then I paused a little bit and I didn't say much in the meeting. I just kind of listened and, and yeah, we were in reasonably good hands, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, maybe I could end there with a story about about the young medical student who climbed Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. did, you, did I ever tell you about that story? He came to do sort of like they have to do a couple of weeks in your practice during one of the electives. Mm. You know, in their final year of med school, yeah. and this very, very upstanding young man came to work at our practice, and he really looked the part. He was well dressed, slim, tall, bright, lovely personality, just the right balance of introvert and extrovert. He wasn't he wasn't afraid to speak his mind, but he didn't over speak it. It was mm. really it was quite a telling man. You know, the profession is you know he's a credit to the profession anyway. I'm telling one of these stories, I'm sounding like a podcast. And he goes, Doc, I must tell you one day, not now, about the time my dad and I went up Mount Everest. And um, I said, really? really? Like, you see, to the so, you know, talented. I mean, he couldn't have been more than, I mean, he's 25 or 29. Mm -hmm. well, when you do this, he said, oh, years ago, we trained for a while. And um, so my dad t took me up Mount Everest. I said, I'm impressed just with that knowledge. I said, I'd love to hear the story. So for the next few days, every time he saw me in the passageway between tasks, he'd say, Doc, don't let me leave the practice without telling the story about getting up to Mount Everest. I said, no, you've got me enthralled. I mean, I'm really curious. And next time we were in surgery, he was helping, assisting me. And he said, it's now a good time to tell the story about so I said, sure. That sounds perfect to me. So he said, well, you know, they went up. And when they got to base camp, they realized that Dad had forgotten the food the food, all, all the food to take up to, he had forgotten it at the village, you know, below Mount Everest, and that he had to rush back, and it delayed the takeoff for a couple of days. And when he came back, he said, now all the food had been taken, but that he had, he had bought some food from the village, and he had it in a canvas sack. And he carried this canvas sack, and it wasn't really time to check it, the update. And the first day was really, really hard. But when they got to the next camp, uh, you know, it wasn't quite a blizzard, and he, he took out two eggs. And um, so, you know, they scrambled them. You know, it's, you know, the higher they go, you know, the boiling point you get, it's, it's much more difficult to boil them. So they scrambled them, and they'd scrambled them. Anyway, time went by, and the group, there, in the professional group, there were 30-odd or so people or more. And uh, the next day was even harder, and at the end of the uh, second day, he, 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 Dad took out, he took out four eggs. And they made a big omelet. <laughs> you know, it's a true story. And um, <laughs> and each day, the dad took out more eggs until they got to the top of the mountain. They didn't have much time on the summit, you know, oxygen and all. Yeah. Uh, and dad took out eight eggs. And that was just too much for this young man. He said, come on, dad. He said, oh, how the heck did you take up so many eggs up Mount Everest? And, and his dad said, oh, I didn't say. He said, what do you mean you didn't? He said, and out of the canvas sack, he took a rooster. And the guy said, no, rooster? What do you mean rooster? He said, Dad, roosters don't lay eggs. And his dad said, Himalayan rooster. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway. <laughs> It's a good thing I'd finished the surgery because he, because up until about this young man is going to be a fine doctor.
<laughs> because until about the third day, I was believing him. <laughs> and, um, and I think I think he's going to be a fine doctor as a result. I mean, to I mean, he just worked me for a few days. He presented it in in, in such a lovely manner with the humour. But enough. <laughs> Anyway, I try and convince people now. I use I have pinched his joke, and and I now <laughs> say that I I went up to, my, but I don't know somehow they you know because of people know me now yeah they kind of go here we go. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be honest with you. I think your issue, John, is that even though I don't know how many times you've told that, but you couldn't keep a straight face telling it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. It is funny. I mean, I, I'm a funny guy, and I tell funny jokes. And I, <laughs> but um, but it's, yeah, it's important. I mean, I I hear you know. Interesting enough, I get most of my my material from like my my really old men, like ninety year old, and they come in with these jokes, and I I find that I must tell the joke a couple of times during the day. So that I remember it for next time, you know. Yeah. So I've, uh, some of my patients are just fun, and I, I learn so much from them, and they're just mm. delightful. And yeah, and and so yeah. No, so personally, I'm going to keep doing what I'm going to do, and then in the future, I hope to to ease back into maybe some sort of science, uh, sort of mm. geological science. I had, uh, I had a whole lot of ideas when I wanted to be a plant pathologist at one stage. Mm. I wanted to be a marine biologist, as you know. I've told you the story of Prof Mole, who mm -hmm. laughed at me and said I couldn't make my joke. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and uh, and then, also, I think I'm quite a keen trout. You know, I, I like to trout fish, you know, yeah. and, and fly fish. And, yeah. um, and actually, we, we 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 some of the things we use to mimic, uh, we don't know too much about their their life cycles, so. There's still work to be done there, so you mm. could combine your hobby with yeah, with, a with a little bit of with a little. I've just realised that there's um, there's some gaps in our knowledge about certain lifestyles mm. and certain sort of things that we use to, mm. to to catch trout, and so yeah, that's kind of you know, and win win the lotto just you know, a couple of times. There's a couple of times to well, I mean, you spent, help fund that. You spent half of that one point six billion. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I wouldn't. You know, be. It just amazes me sometimes these rich people. There's so many, you know. I have a few Zimbabwean patients who's who keep me, uh, you know, reminded of my roots. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, just wonderful people, the Zimbabweans. I, I just, I have to say, um, yeah, Zimbabweans. You know, it's a, people say, oh, you know, oh, are you from, you know, they hear my accent. Oh, you're from South Africa. And I'm, I'm Zimbabwean. And I say, oh, same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes between uh, Australians and New Zealanders, yeah. you know, it's, it's down there, yeah, yeah. civic, you know, yeah. you know. So. But but really quite different because uh, Zimbabwe was, you know, the and and the the foundation of the justice system can set the tone of a society, in my opinion. Mm. Um, so the justice system in uh, Zimbabwe is is of course the British system. It's common law. Mm. Um, Whereas South Africa is Roman Dutch law. And and that, would you believe, I think that's fundamental to understanding the difference between the two societies and, and how they operate. And and it's, it, it's you know, a great tragedy what's happened to Zimbabwe, um, really. And, you know, it's not, I, I, the politics are complex. But, but the people I just remember is good. Mm. That's my overwhelming feeling of where I come from, is the mm. people are good. Um, um, and so, really, there's a part of me that just, you know, they talk about reparations and, you know, stuff and that. I, you know, I'd, I'd, for me, that's quite a grand thought. On a personal level, it would be quite nice to, I don't know, just go back to the old school or something and do something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Would it, would it, would it be seen as sort of, you know, me doing something sort of white person saving? Or I don't know. There's just that feeling. Or maybe it comes of being a doctor. You want to help. Yeah. And how could I do that in a way that doesn't make it about me, but about what I could do? Mm. Uh, it, and that reminds me of the last story. 
I, I, you know, I got a lot of cups at school in my, you know, in my final year at school, I was a bit surprised. I got, I got all the certificates for all the subjects except geography. I didn't take geography and Afrikaans. I wasn't very good at Afrikaans and, um, but everything else, uh, I still have the certificates mm. and they, they got fed up. So instead of giving me a certificate for each subject came first in the subject came first in, they gave me three certificates with all the subjects <laughs> listed on them. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and they're still in Afrikaans. And, um, and then I got a few scholarships and, you know, I ended up with just too much in my opinion because I was leaving school and as nice as it was, it didn't matter. Nobody cares what I got at school, really. Um, so I donated a cup to the school for to be issued to the most improved student um, that had to be given to anybody other than in the last year. Because, um, you know, it, it, it matters more when you need an, something to inspire yeah. you or encourage you further back. Than, than Anyway, about 10 years ago, maybe more, uh, probably more when I think about it, because Mugabe, Mugabe had really done a few things in the country, he was heading in the wrong direction, and the school was, was going to close. It, it had been told by the government it couldn't raise its fees, but inflation was 10 million percent per year or something ridiculous, and they were just going to have to close the school. And so they contacted me. How the heck they found me, I don't know. <laughs> but it gave me hope because to find me in a needle in a haystack in the world meant that the education was good. Yeah. And um, they said, look, would you like your trophy back? You know, the trophy I donated yeah, yeah. in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. Um, I couldn't believe that. I, I said, well, yeah. But, and I, the plan was that for them to send it to me and then I'd donate it to the school my children went to, you know, yeah. perhaps with a small scholarship. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm pleased to say that, that, you know, good sense prevailed and the school was able to survive. So... Back in Zimbabwe, in a little, little skill, a school in a boarding school somewhere, is uh, the Barclay Family Trust. Uh, I, I know the Barclay Family uh, Trophy for the most improved student, and right. maybe that's my legacy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome, yeah, <laughs> awesome. I think that's uh, that's a good note to to, to finish on. I, I think I, I always enjoy uh, our conversations. And I'm really grateful for you coming in and spending time with us today. My pleasure. Um, I'm already thinking about the next uh, next time. Yeah, there, there are, Korean. you know, uh, there, there are, are other things stories. that we need yeah, to talk about. We haven't spoken about today. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you're willing, you know, Emmanuel I Kant think. and you know, and his philosophy of, mm. yeah. So I think there are other things that we can, you know, stuff that you can uh, you can impart, yeah. wisdom worth sharing, uh, which is what this is all about, really. And um, and you've done a lot of that today, so I'm really grateful. So thank you very much for that. It's my pleasure. And thank you for having me on your podcast. All right. Cheers. Cheers. I love catching up with Sean, which is strange, really, because most of the time I do, I'm in his doctor's rooms. As he states in this discussion, I often get the last appointment of the day. And our conversations can go on a long time, which often gets him in trouble with his wife for not being home on time. Uh, Jackie is an amazing artist, by the way. So check out her website at JackieBarkley.art. That's Jackie, G-A-C-K-I. And hopefully that'll get Sean back in the good books. Anyway, I really enjoyed the opportunity to interview Sean because of his wisdom and wit. As you will hopefully know, if you've seen other episodes... This segment of the podcast is about wisdom worth sharing. At the end of every interview, I look back as part of the editing process and discover some of the gems that came out in the conversation and summarize them here. There was so much to choose from in the episode or two episodes that we split for Sean, but I'm going to focus on two main areas, knowledge and humor. What Sean highlighted for us was his thirst for knowledge which truly makes him an interesting person. Ask anyone who's ever been in his presence. He has so many stories and anecdotes, and he makes them so interesting with the huge volume of facts he knows by being a student of every aspect of life. When you're with Sean, you're learning without knowing you're learning. In fact, 
we often get stories within stories due to the tangents that he can go off because he knows so much about so much. So the title of this episode, or episodes rather, is You Just Gotta Read, which is a quote from Sean. He bought two books and half read one of them before the interview. What Sean is telling us was to be hungry for knowledge and live a life of learning. It's caused Sean to delve into and investigate a huge variety of subjects to deepen his understanding of how things work. It's also this knowledge that keeps his mind and his wit sharp. Which leads me nicely into a quote from Sean. You said, it's important to impart knowledge with humour. Don't take yourself too seriously. Through humorous storytelling, Sean certainly did this in this interview. But this is just a reflection of who he is. He didn't put that on for us. This just comes naturally to him. Humor plays such an important role in our society, and I think we need more of it, now more than ever. In this ever-increasingly PC world that we live in, there's a real risk we'll lose the willingness of people to put their neck on the line for the sake of humor. There's risk associated with humor, because who knows how it will land until it's landed. Sean's ability to read people ensures that it lands well, and when it does, it can be magical. Humor, laughter, as we know, is the best medicine, and I don't just mean that literally, although I can attest to that working in Sean's surgery. But it's important everywhere in our lives. At work, it can help create a great and productive culture. At play, it can help teams win. In love, it can help create long bonds, and with family, well, where would families be without it? There's nothing I love more than to hear the laughter of either my wife or my daughters from across the house somewhere. I have no idea what they're laughing at, but it's infectious. And at the very least, it makes me smile, if not laugh out loud with them, even though I'm not with them, I'm by myself. When I feel a bit down, I often think about the laughter of my girls because it has the ability to change my state. Try it. It works. It's like they say, it's almost impossible to not smile at someone who smiles at you. And laughter works the same way. And it's powerful. My parents are the funniest people I've ever met. And I know that their ability to see the funny side of even the most serious of situations is what's got us through things. And so I'm thankful to my mum and dad for giving me the gift of humour. Sean uses humour to make people feel better. He describes having people walk into his rooms being disgruntled or even extremely unhappy at times. But his ability to ensure that they leave with a smile on their face is why his patients stay with him. Personally, I take a book whenever I have an appointment with him because I know I'm going to have to wait a while. Do I mind? Absolutely not. Because I know that he's providing the people in front of me with the same level of service that I receive, and I think that's awesome. Sean has actually saved my life in the past, and he's helped me through some tough times. His medical knowledge, intuition, wisdom, and ability to decode people and situations combined with the ability to communicate effectively and use humour appropriately means that you feel heard and understood. That's medicine in itself. But him taking that time means he's able to give the best advice and support. Now, you might be thinking, I need a doctor like that. And yeah, you do. But my point here is, why can't we have more people like Sean in every aspect of our life? Why can't more of us be like Sean? and leave people feeling better after our interaction with them. What would the world look like if we all did that? I think it would be a better place. I hope you enjoyed listening to Sean's story as much as I did, and hopefully you've been able to take something away from it that you can apply to some aspect of your life, work, or legacy. Use it, share it with others. Sharing is like teaching, and it helps cement things in your mind, and it helps us commit to change which is always required if we want to enhance our life's work. I wish you well for the future, and I hope that you're happy, safe, and successful in all that you do. Remember, live a life that's a story worth retelling. I'm Steve Worsley, and I look forward to seeing you next time on Life's Work, the podcast all about wisdom worth sharing.